Good. So welcome to this second, I think, at this point, and it looks like uh, of a good number to come uh, of um, basically worldwide chats about Stoicism. I'm actually, the more I think about this, the more I am inclined to continue these even after the damn pandemic is going to be over. Uh, it's going to be one interesting way to connect with people from you know, all over the world, or at least from the areas in the world where uh, one is still awake at this time. Uh, we're doing it now at five o'clock Eastern time, New York. Uh, that's because it was close to the original schedule for the original in-person meeting. But in the near future, I'm going to start scheduling these around four o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time, uh, because that kind of maximizes uh, participation from the areas that are more likely to participate. And that would be the West Coast in the United States, Europe, and Australia and New Zealand. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so uh, welcome to this chat today. The topic is the Stoic God and whether we should um, believe in it. I have a few notes. Uh, I suggested two articles uh, that were linked to the meetup site as a sort of background uh, reading. In reality, there were a little bit more than two because if you notice, if you actually uh, took a look at the articles, two, those two articles are by me, but I was responding to three different people. So you had enough for the five articles to, to, to read if you wanted to. Uh, it's a fairly controversial topic among modern Stoic practitioners, and hopefully today we'll explore uh, why. I'm going to start by giving you sort of a few basic pointers on this thing. I'm not going to go point by point through the articles because if you read them, that will be useless and redundant. If you haven't read them, it's going to take too much time. You can do it later. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background and some and some. Uh, basic pointers and then we'll open up for discussion and we are aiming for wrapping up this thing within an hour or so okay so that in order to be respectful of everybody's time and so on so if you have questions and, and um, or comments feel free to interrupt in any any min moment just raise your virtual hand so first of all what what is the problem here uh, the problem is that the ancient stoics maintain that there are there were three parts to their philosophy one uh, they called the physics, the second one they called the logic, the third one they called the ethics, right? We know this from a number of sources, the major one being uh, Diogenes Laertius, but also Cicero talks about it in uh, the Finibus Bonorum et Malorum. So what were these three parts? The, the three names are actually a little bit misleading, as you probably know, but let me go through them quickly. Physics, uh, which I typically spell either with in quotation marks or with, with big P. It's not just physics as we understand it today. They were not just interested in, you know, quarks and atoms and things like that. Uh, it was the totality of what we today call natural science, metaphysics, and theology. All three of them combined. Okay. Um, more properly, it should be used, it should be called the metaphysics today. It essentially is a account of how the world works. Right. So like physics, or broadly speaking, metaphysics, is an account of how the world works. Logic was also broader than we understand it today. Uh, today, we tend to think about logic as a sort of specific discipline within philosophy, mathematics, computer science, things like that. Um, but what they meant by it was anything at all that was relevant to good human reasoning. Okay. Uh, so not only logic you know, in, in, in the strict sense, but also uh, cognitive science, what we today call cognitive science, psychology, uh, the study of, of, of our you know, biases, you know, cognitive biases, all, all sorts of stuff. Rhetoric was included, dialectic was included, everything that improves or make us un better understand human reason. And then the third one was ethics. Ethics also is kind of in quotation marks because today in modern philosophy, ethics tends to be the study of right and wrong actions, right? So the, the debates in modern moral philosophy are about, you know, what kind of criteria do you use to decide whether an action is right or wrong and that sort of stuff. But for the Stoics and for the ancient, uh, ancient Greek and Romans in general, ethics was literally the study of how to live your life. So it was much broader. Of course, it includes a, a notion of right and wrong, good and, and evil and things like that, but it's much broader. The three go together in the following sense, and Diogenes Laertius is very, is very clear about this. Physics and logic inform the ethics. In order to live a good life, a life worth living for a human being, you have to reason correctly about things, so you have to know logic, and you have to have an understanding of how the world works, so you have to know physics. 
because if you don't uh, reason correctly or if you reason on the basis of a misconceived notion of how the world works then you got trouble right you can't you can't navigate the world in terms of eth ethical terms if you don't actually understand how to reason about the facts of the world that was the basic idea now given that then the problem becomes that uh, the, the modern discussion is well fine so most of us accept modern Stoic practitioners that accept a lot of Stoic ethics. But do we have also to accept all of Stoic logic and all of Stoic physics? Because if that's the case, then we're going to be in trouble, right? Especially with the physics. Uh, I'll get to God in a minute uh, to be more, more specific because that's today's topic. But let me just convince you that there's no way that a modern Stoic could possibly seriously follow all of the ancient uh, take on these things. Let's start with Stoic logic. Stoic logic was actually very advanced by the, by the time. It was more sophisticated than Aristotelian logic that we, most of us are familiar with. Um, and in fact, it became a, a influential during the Middle Ages and it became, it was still the major type of logic that professional logicians used until the end of the 19th century. It's called propositional logic because it has to do with propositions, with the, with the, with the functioning of propositions. Um, Proposition logic is still valid today. It's called, sometimes it's called uh, uh, zero, uh, zero degree logic. First, then there's a first degree logic, second degree logic, and so on and so forth. But uh, it's the most simple kind of logic that you can have in modern, you know, in, in modern parlance, in modern terms. But it's still valid. And you can still use it. You can still apply two propositions and figuring out whether you know, your syllogisms are correct, whether you're deriving your conclusions correctly from your premises and so on and so forth. It, it deals with conditionals. So if then kind of statements. So it's a fairly sophisticated type of logic. It's still valid. Um, but of course, we don't have necessarily to accept uh, every single detail of stoic logic as it was laid out by the ancients um, in order to function as Stoic practitioners today. We don't actually need much more advanced logic than that. As it turns out, first order and second order logic are actually not necessary for most day-to-day -day applications. Uh, so zero, zero order logic is actually more than enough. But you, that doesn't mean you have to buy everything that Chrysippus, let's say, says about um, ancient logic. Hard also to know exactly what he said because all of his books are lost, but never, never mind that. But the thing becomes more complicated for the physics, because there are clearly certain aspects of uh, ancient Stoic physics that appear to be valid today, and then there are certain aspects of ancient Stoic physics that clearly are not um, valid today. And then after I go through a couple of these, just to give you examples, then we're gonna get to the issue of God, which is an open question as far as this meeting is concerned, right? Is that actually something that we should retain or reject and what are the consequences if we do reject it, okay? Um, the consequences in terms of stoic ethics, mostly. So there are some things that are clearly acceptable still today. The stoics were materialists. They thought that the universe is made of stuff. Now matter, of course, doesn't have to be necessarily what they understood as being matter. But if we understand matter as whatever modern physics says it is, whether it is particles or strings or fields or whatever the hell you want, it doesn't matter uh, in a sense, uh, right? So, but if we understand materialism to be, in fact, modern, the modern term used in philosophy in metaphysics is physicalism. If we understand stoic physicalism as saying, look, the universe is made of stuff and there are no transcendental entities. There's no, nothing outside of the realm of the physical, uh, then that squares pretty well with modern science still today. So we're fine with that. There's no, there's no problem there. Um, Stoics also were big into cause and effect. They believed in universal causation. They, in fact, Chrysippus apparently uh, described a bunch of different levels of causes, you know, proximate and more distal causes, and all that sort of stuff. But for all effective purposes, the Stoics believed that everything that happens has a cause, not necessarily a reason, because reasons are a particular kind of cause, but a cause. Again, modern science is okay with that. Despite discussions within fundamental physics about the role of causality in you know, quantum mechanics or things like that, as it turns out, you know, essentially 99% of modern science relies on a basic concept of causality. So causality is fine, physicalism is fine, 
know, all of these things are okay, and they are uh, they were part of ancient Stoic uh, physic, physics. Now, there are some parts, however, that we clearly reject. For instance, the Stoics believed in divination, right? So the ability of predicting the future based on certain signs that you could read in the present. Well, we don't believe in, 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 in divination. We, we think that divination is, 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 at this point, is a superstition. It's, it's, you know, it's, not a, it's not a thing. It's not something that works. They believed in it for a good reason at the time. Um, and the good reason was, well, if everything is interconnected by cause and effect, then it stands to reason that by looking at a particular portion of that web, universal web of cause and effect, I ought to be able to reconstruct everything that happened in the past and everything that's going to happen in the future. In a sense, that's still what we believe when we do science, right? Whenever we infer something about the past, let's say a meteor killed the dinosaurs or contributed to the, to the uh, you know, wiping out of the dinosaurs. Well, why, why, why do we say that? Because we have certain things that we can observe now that we can then project back into time and say, okay, if this is true now, if I can see the crater now, which we can, it's off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, then I can infer that there was a big asteroid. I can measure the size of the asteroid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can do, I can use backward, you know, uh, causal inferences backwards. Same when we predict the future, when we predict, uh, uh, climate change, or we predict the weather, or we predict the stock market, that doesn't work very well usually. But uh, whenever we make predictions in the future, we use the same principle. But we don't do it on the basis of the kind of divination that the ancient Stoics were doing. I mean, you know, reading entrails of animals and things like that, or flights of eagles and stuff like that. We don't believe that we, you can do that kind of divination. So this is a clear example of something that the Stoics believed, and it's out of the question. Another thing that seems to me it's out of the question is their idea of recursive, a recursive universe. They thought that the universe had a beginning, a uh, big conflagration, big fire, uh, and then it will have an end, another big fire, and then it will start over exactly the same. And this thing is going to be repeated over and over and over for eternity. Well, modern cosmology tells us a different story. Right? I mean, there, are things, there were, in fact, until recently, some modern cosmological models that, that kind of went that way. Recursive, a recursive universe, a big bang and a big crunch. Um, however, because, at the very least, because of quantum mechanics, if you think of the, uh, the big bang, bang as starting it with a quantum singularity, then there isn't going to be an exact recursiveness of anything because the initial condition is going to be randomly different every time, even if you do believe that the universe goes through cycles. And a lot of cosmologists don't believe that the universe goes through cycles. There's, you know, there are models that predict the thermal depth and no big crunch. There are models that predict universes bunning out of each other. Whatever it is, the current version, current, current cosmological theories don't seem to go very well with the ancient Stoic ones. So that to me, to my mind, establishes fairly convincingly that obviously we don't need to accept everything from Stoic uh, early physics as modern sources if we want modern stoicisms to be compatible with modern science, which I would, that's, that's one of the assumptions I'm studying it, uh, I'm studying uh, here. Well, then the question, the next question is, does God fall into the ancient stoic God fall into the first category or in the second one? Is the notion of the, is the ancient notion of the stoic God uh, more close to their notion of uh, universal cause and effect or their notion of, uh, of physicalism, or is it closer to divination and that sort of thing, right? That's the question we're asking today. And if it turns out that it's closer, that the notion of the ancient God is closer to, you know, cause and effect, then, then there's no problem. Then we can, you know, you can accept the existence of the Stoic God, you're fine, not a problem, and we're done with the discussion. If it turns out it isn't, if it turns out it's more like divination, then that raises an, a further question, which is, okay, does that change something about the ethics? Because that's what we really care about, right? Uh, we want to we we wanna practice stoicism in our daily life. And so if it turns out that rejecting some portions of stoic physics have an effect on the ethics, then that creates a problem, okay? So let me look at some of my notes because I want to actually read you a couple of quotes um, that are pertinent. Like, for instance, uh, so, why, why might this create a problem? It might create a problem because the Stoics, by this I mean the rejection of the Stoic God, because the Stoics believed in if some version of providence. Not providence as understood, let's say, in the Christian tradition, 
but nevertheless a kind of providence. Uh, here is Epictetus, for instance, in Discourses 2, uh, 2, 6. He says, if I in fact knew that illness had been decreed for me at this moment by destiny, I would welcome even death, for the foot too, if it had understanding, would be eager to get spattered with mud. This is a famous metaphor, which is used also by Marcus Aurelius, probably because he was you know, influenced by Epictetus, uh, not by chance. And the metaphor is basically that the universe is, and we're, we're, with this one we're getting to the nature of the Stoic God. The universe, according to the Stoics, was a living organism, endowed with reason. The, log the famous logos is this stuff that, that, that is permeating the universe. In fact, uh, technically, what permeates the universe is the pneuma, which translates to breath. And pneuma has different types. There are different types of pneuma depending on the tension of the, the pneuma. We don't need to get into the technical details, but the point is, uh, there is this stuff that permeates the universe. The higher level of this stuff is called the logos, and that is what makes possible for, for sentient, rational beings to exist. Okay? So we are in that. We, human beings, are in that with the logos because we're capable of rational thinking. Okay? The Stoics thought that the universe itself was a living organism and it was endowed with the logos. That's why the metaphor of the foot in the, and the mud here is convincing. And basically what Epictetus is saying is like, look, if the foot didn't know that it was part of an organism, right, and it all of a sudden found itself, itself in the mud, it would be like, yuck, I don't want to do this. This is disgusting. What the hell? I don't, I, why, why should I get into the mud? But if the foot understood that, hey, I am connected to an organism, to a whole body, and that body has to cross the path, and the path is muddy, and I, am the, I happen to be the foot, I'm not the nose, I'm not the eyes, I'm not, I, I'm, I am the foot, then it's my duty to cross the, the path into the mud, to get into the mud. So not only it is inevitable, this is an important part of Stoic providence, not only it's inevitable for the foot to step into the mud, the foot should actually be glad of stepping in the mud, as unpleasant as it is. Why? Because he's, he's doing the, uni, the, the, the work of the universe. He's helping the body doing what he needs to do. Right? So the analogy there, therefore, is when, he, when Epictetus says, if I knew that illness had been decreed for me at this very moment by destiny, I would welcome even that. He's not saying I would accept it. Acceptance is not enough here. It's not just acceptance, it's embracing, okay? You're actually happy to be, uh, to be sick because somehow, you don't understand how, but somehow that's helping the universe. Now you can see why there is a connection between the stoic God and, and the ethics because if we're gonna get rid of the stoic God, there is a chance that a significant portion of stoic ethics is also gonna go out the, the, the window particularly the part about providence. So um, let me see. Yeah, I'm going to stop here. I have a, a, a triple quote coming up in a minute, which I think makes that an interesting point. But I'm going to stop here for a minute and see if anybody has questions or, or comments, and then we'll resume the presentation, so to speak. So any, anyone has? Yes, somebody does. Ron, go ahead. Ron, you there? If you are, you have to turn on uh, your microphone because I can't hear you. Yes. Are you oh, able yes, to hear me? Yes, oh, okay. I can hear you. Go ahead. So wait, let me just get rid of this on, on my screen. Okay. okay, so I want to ask about, you know, the important Stoics, the, one you're, the, the ones you're familiar with. And... Um, are any of them like real familiar with the ancient mystery religions? And, you know, because first of all, they, they might be aware of it just from general knowledge, but I'm wondering if any of them actually participated because, you know, there's some evidence that, that people used uh, psychedelics or, or, yeah. or, or used ascetic, uh, like ascetic practices or, or, or deep meditation or something to have transpersonal experiences. So what yeah. can you say about that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so, um, sorry, 
I'm trying to do too many things at the same time here. Uh, it's a good question. Um, we don't have any evidence of any of the major Stoics with the possible exception of Marcus Aurelius uh, doing anything on that sort. Uh, and I say possible exception of Marcus Aurelius because Marcus was, called, of course, the emperor. And we know that he was a sort of a pious emperor. We don't know whether he actually believed in like the, the, the standard gods, the Olympian gods and things like that. Um, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but he felt like he had to be, because one of his um, roles as emperor was also, he, he also had the, the office of um, Pontifex Maximus, which interestingly in modern times is the, is the, um, uh, is the term that the, that the Catholic Church uses for the Pope, Pontifex Maximus. But in ancient Rome, uh, that was the guy who was in charge of the religious rights, basically, in the city. And these were very important. The Romans took, took uh, religious rights very, in, very importantly. So we know that Marcus was involved in that sort of thing. Uh, there's no direct evidence that I know of, at least, that he was actually initiated in the, in the mystery religions, but it's very possible. We have no reason to believe that Seneca or Epictetus were, although the big caveat here is, all th is that, as usual, never say the ancient Stoics didn't do this or didn't, or didn't say that because more than 90%, if not 99% of these ancient texts are lost. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know what they actually did or said. We, we can, you know, we know if they, if, if something has survived, but if something has not survived, that's not a license to say, oh, they never did that. But there's no reference in any, any of the extant texts um, to that sort of thing. I would also argue that those sort of, uh, uh, practices, rituals, would be at odds with what we know of Stoic philosophy, uh, because the Stoics were very careful not to take, um, you know, anything, not to indulge in anything that would interfere with uh, their capacity to reason. Uh, Diogenes Laertius famously says in the Lives of the Eminent Philosophers in, in Volume 7, which is about the Stoics, he says the Stoics drink wine, but they don't get drunk. Mm. Right? And so the notion being that uh, for, Stoi for the Stoics, of course, as we know, reason was, sort of was paramount. And so uh, you don't do anything that impair impairs the reason. But at any rate, we don't have any, any direct evidence that that, that that was the case. So there's no discussion in the, in the extent in Stoic text about uh, that sort of stuff. Um, any other questions or comments so far before we go ahead? Yes, I see another hand. Uh, Bob uh, Seinberg? Hey, Bob, Matt, Mo. Uh, yeah, yep, here. Hey, how's it going? Hey, I'm a huge Good. fan, first of all, and uh, I love Thank your uh, Stoic Meditations podcast and the books you've been just um, fanboying out right here. So, it's, um, <laughs> I just had a question. I don't know if this is going to go into your next session, your next section of the talk. So please, if it does, you can just start it. But when Stoics say providence, is that uh, to me, it's really, it's a kind of an obscure idea. Is that kind of God's hand guiding the universe, the physics of the universe? Is that kind of like the background? He's, they're kind of in control, the God are? Is, that, is it that type of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's clarify what, that, what they mean by that. Um, uh, hold on a second. I keep doing multiple things simultaneously. Uh, I need an assistant somehow, somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a great question. No, they didn't mean something like that, but it's important to, to be clear on what, as clear as we can, on what they did mean. So providence was definitely not, there was no planned, uh, you know, no plan of creation. It's not, they did not conceive of God as somehow external to the world and, you know, creating the world and, and, and making a plan, like sort of essentially like the Christian God. And the reason for that is because the Stoics were pantheists. They thought that God was imminent in, in, the, in the universe. It's, it's, in fact, it, Diogenes Laertius very clearly says explicitly uh, that the Stoics used interchangeably the words God, Zeus, nature, and cause and effect. This is important because this, this, is, a, this is a big one, right? On the one hand, they used, they called, they used to call the, the, the word Zeus or God. Epictetus often talks about God and, and uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius sometimes refers to Zeus uh, or Seneca does as well. And this is important because that was a, their, their nod to the standard Greek and Roman religion, 
right? So Zeus was what everybody else believed in. But what they understood by Zeus, they, they believed in one God, and that one God was the universe itself, was this living organism that is the universe. When they say, when Lajan Slaerci says, the, they use the same word for nature and for cause and effect, that makes pretty clear what they mean. They, they, sometimes this is referred to as Spinoza's God because the uh, early modern philosopher Baruch Spinoza believed in something like that. In fact, uh, Spinoza's metaphysics and ethics are very similar to the Stoics. They're, they're very highly influenced by the Stoics. Um, and it's sometimes referred to also as Einstein's God because Einstein at some point was famously asked, you know, do you believe in God? His response was, yeah, I believe in the, in the laws of nature. Okay. However, the difference between Einstein God and the Stoics is that I don't think at least Einstein meant understood the universe as a living organism. But on the other hand, the Stoics actually did. So what they meant by providence was not a plan. There was no plan. And certainly they didn't mean that God gives Uh, okay. Sorry, we jumped out of because I got a call off on the, offline. Uh, they they don't uh, they don't think that that providence is uh, you know in a sense so sort of protective or interested that God is interested in of individual in individual human beings. God doesn't love us. The analogy I think the better analogy remember the analogy of the foot, right and the body. I think in modern terms a better analogy is like imagine that I am God, I'm the, the organism, and the little, every cell making up my body, on my skin, inside my body, etc. those are the individuals, right? And so it is certainly the case that each cell has a role to play in my body. It is certainly the case that it has a good role to play for my health, right? Uh, it is certainly the case that if the individual cells don't behave correctly, I might get, my health might suffer. You know, that's, for instance, when you get cancer, it's a, cells misbehaving, right? Um, but it definitely is not the case that does not mean that I as an individual care about every single cell in my body. I only care about the general health of my body. I don't, I don't actually say, oh yeah, this is, this is a little Epictetus cell and he's doing a good job and it doesn't matter, right? So providence in that sense, uh, not in the sense of a God that actually pays attention or loves or cares about the individuals it's in the sense of the individuals are part of, of a greater whole and we have a play to a, a role to play in the universe and that is why uh, we should be glad about what happened okay so let me read you let me go back and read um, a couple of other quotes actually to be precise three quotes um, that would make clear where this whole thing comes from so where did the stoics get this notion that the world is God, that the world is some kind of sort of essentially intelligently operating. And I maintain that the argument that they make, they do make the argument, an argument, and we know what argument they make in detail because it's, it's, you find it in the discourses, in the discourses, but you actually find it in Cicero's On the Nature of Gods, of the Gods. Cicero there gives three quotes, which I'm gonna read in a, in a minute, and you'll see these are from the ancient Stoics. These are from, the, uh, from Zeno, Cleantes, and Chrysippus. So these are the first, the second, and the third head of the Stoa, right? Zeno is the originator of the philosophy, and then Cleantes was his student, Chrysippus was also his student. You'll see what they mean by reading, by reading these quotes. They are essentially what, um, modern, uh, what in modern times would refer to as an argument from design, okay? And uh, for the existence of God. So here it is. The first quote is in, uh, this, these are all from Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods, book two. In book two, five, Cicero says, Cleantes, the second head of the store, uh, additional cause for the existence of God and the strongest is drawn from the regularity of the motion and revolution of the heavens, the distinctiveness, variety, beauty, and order of the sun, moon, and all the other stars the appearance only of which is sufficient to convince us that they are not the effects of chance. Okay. The second quote, 2.8. Nothing, says Zeno, that is destitute itself of life and reason can generate a being possessed of life and reason. But the world does generate beings possessed of life and reason. The world, therefore, is not itself destitute 
of life and reason. And then the third quote is uh, true 14. And he says, for Chrysippus says very acutely that as the case is made for the buckler and the scabbard for the sword, so all things except the universe were made for the sake of something else. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. The first and the third quote, Cleanthes and Chrysippus, are basically making an argument from design. Cleanthes is saying, look, the universe is just too complicated and too beautiful and too orderly for there not being some kind of intelligence behind it. And then Chrysippus says essentially the same thing, but he uses a metaphor. He says, um, like the scabbard is made for the sword. They're not made at random. They're not just two objects that happen to fit in, in, with each other. They're, they're obviously made by somebody on purpose. This is very reminiscent of, uh, reminiscent of uh, the argument from design as famously put forth by William Paley at the beginning of the 19th century and to which Darwin responded. Right? Paley uses this analogy, says, uh, imagine that I'm walking down a beach and I find a pebble. Well, I'm not too concerned. You know, the pebble is clearly a natural result of natural processes. That's okay. But now, Let's say that I find a watch. Well, I immediately think, deduce that there is a watchmaker, right? Because watches are not natural objects. They're clearly, they're so complex. They have a purpose, they have a function. They are, they're put together by something that it has to have intelligence. That's it. That is, in a nutshell, the argument from design. Now, so that's what the Stoics are using. And in uh, Epictetus, I don't have the quote from Epictetus, but Epictetus in this course is to essentially uses the same quote, uh, the same, sorry, the same argument. The second quote, it's a little different, the one from Zeno. Zeno there is saying that, uh, let me reread it again, because it's, uh, it's really interesting. It's actually a fallacious argument. Zeno was not that good at logic, as it turns out. Uh, Chrysippus was the, 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 the Stoic logician. But Zeno makes this mistake, and interestingly, Marcus Aurelius makes a similar mistake in the meditations. This has been pointed out by others, by scholars a number of times. So here says, Zeno says that, it, um, that is destitute, it's nothing, says Zeno, that is destitute itself of life and reason can generate a being possessed of life and reason. But the world does generate beings possessed of life and reason. The world therefore is not itself destitute of life and reason. This is an argument. He's making a premise and he's drawing a conclusion. However, the conclusion is based on a fallacy of composition. He's assuming that a characteristic that is, that is present in parts of an object are also characteristic of the whole object. He says, look, the universe contains beings that are capable of reason, therefore the universe is capable of reason. That obviously doesn't follow. You, you, you can see that that is actually fallacious reasoning. You can have the universe being an, uh, you know, a material process, set of processes, and then within those processes, something that, alive, that is alive occurs and is capable of reason occurs, that's us, and maybe Martians, or whatever, or us but that does, it doesn't follow. This is actually a well-known logical fallacy. It just does not follow. So we got Xeno you know, into logical fallacy there. All right, so let me stop there. Uh, well, actually, no, let me add one more thing, and then we'll reopen the discussion. If I'm right here, and this, is, this seems to be pretty clear that the Stoics get this notion of God from essentially a, the ancient version of the um, argument from design, which by the way, it's found in other ancient writers. Uh, it's, it's found in Plato, for instance. In the Timaeus, Plato makes a similar argument. Well, the argument from design was very appealing at the time. This, this is, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't blame the Stoics or Plato for that matter for accepting this kind of argument. This was actually a cogent argument at the time, okay? And it, and it uh, kept being a cogent argument up until the 18th century. In the 18th century, a fellow named David Hume came about and he, and he demolished the argument basically on, for, in a number, of, in a number of, of ways. You can check his uh, um, inquiry on, on, uh, on, the, um, on human understanding, for instance. Uh, there's a specific essay that, um, about the argument from design that, that uh, David Hume published, and it really dismantled the whole argument bit by bit. That was part one of why we don't accept anymore the design argument. What David Hume did was to dismantle the argument to show like, no, actually it doesn't follow. All of these things don't follow. The only reason, for instance, why, um, Bailey could say, Bailey wrote after Hume, by the way, apparently unaware that Hume had demolished the argument already. But um, David Hume says, no, you can't 
infer the existence of a, of a watchmaker, let's say, from, from um, uh, actually, you can, ex you can infer, let me rephrase it, you can infer the existence of a watchmaker by, by seeing a watch, but that's only because you know what watches are and you've seen watchmakers. If you did not have any idea of what this stuff was or and ne never seen anybody meaning, uh, making it, you actually wouldn't be able to make any reasonable inference. You, for all you know, it could be the result of a natural process. And so he says, since we've never seen a designer, an intelligent designer creating universes, you actually cannot make that inference. He says, that's an inference by analogy and arguments by analogy are bad arguments, are usually typically uh, weak arguments in philosophy. He also says, but, if you really want to make that argument, then let's follow the argument through. What do we know of designers, of, of you know, human designers? We know that there's more than one. We know that they're imperfect, and we know that they die. So Hume says, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, you sure you want to make that argument, you Christian theologian? Because it turns out that then we'll have to admit that there are multiple gods, they're mortal, and they're imperfect. You probably don't want to go there. So there's a number of reasons why David Hume sort of really did a job on the design argument. However, he did not have an alternative. He really did not have an explanation for the obvious fact that the Stoics had observed that, um, you know, the eyes do have a function. They are complex. They're not random as, as assembling of, of atoms or molecules or something like that. So how do you explain that? Well, for that, we have to wait another century or so. Right, yes, a bit, a bit, a little bit, bit less than another century, 1858. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and, Darwin, and Charles Darwin published uh, their paper on, uh, that then became uh, uh, Darwin's book on the origin of species. And now we have the second part of the argument. Um, in fact, Darwin himself in the origin of species actually talks about uh, William Paley and the, and the argument from design. And he says, well, now we have an alternative. We have, we have a mechanism. We, we know now of a process called natural selection that can actually create not only complexity, but actually the, this, this, this fitting of the sword and the scabbard that Chris Eppold was talking about. So in terms of modern science, of course, that was the end of the intelligent design argument. After Hume and Darwin, this, this sort of double punch that the argument got, no serious philosopher or scientist has actually considered the argument from design. Of course, we all know half of Americans are creationists and they do believe in the argument from, from design, but that's them um, and not, not us. So that's where we are right now. So what I suggest, in fact, what I suggested already a few years ago in uh, How to Be a Stoic in the, in the book, there's a, there's a chapter about God and, uh, and the design argument from the Stoics where I uh, ideally talk to Epictetus and I say, look, this was very reasonable in your time, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny right now. So let's pause here and take a few more, uh, more questions or comments. The next one is Fred Rosa. Fred, are you there? Um, yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the discussion. Very, very interesting. And my question is not so much on the nature of God itself, but if the Stoic worldview is deterministic, assuming it's deterministic, what implications does this have on the dichotomy of control, right? On what is up to us and what isn't? Yeah. That's my question. Yeah, well, I'm going to address that, but only very briefly, because it has only marginally to do with, with, the, uh, with the God thing, and I'd like to stick to the, to the topic. We're probably going to have a whole different discussion about, about that at some point in the future. They do have an answer. Yes, they are determinists, although the word determinism there means simply that they believe in cause and effect, right? Uh, any, they, they don't necessarily subscribe to any heavier, more fundamental, more, more metaphysical notion of determinism. Um, they're kind of agnostic about that. They basically say, look, everything that, has, that, that happens has causes. And our own judgments and decisions to act and not to act and uh, values that we endorse, which are the things that are up to us, according to Epictetus, also have causes, right? The question is, what causes? And there is, Chrysippus is the one that um, put forth uh, most organically, uh, the, you know, they articulated the Stoic view on this. Uh, and uh, we, we learn about this from, from Cicero. And uh, the, uh, the notion is, uh, the, the analogy that Chrysippus uses is that of a cylinder. So imagine a cylinder, you know, made of metal, let's say, and you put it on a, on a flat surface. And Chrysippus says, so what happens if you push the cylinder? Cylinder obviously is gonna roll, right? And if, then Chrysippus says, why is the cylinder rolling? And the intuitive answer is, well, because you just pushed it. 
But, but Chrysippus says, well, that's part of the answer. Another part of the answer is that it is in the nature of cylinders to roll when they're pushed. If instead of a cylinder you had a cube, the cube would not roll, right? This is his analogy to make clear that causes are not all on the same level. There are some external causes of event, and then there are internal causes of events. The push is an, on the cylinder is an external cause, the, but it's the nature, it's the internal nature of the cylinder that allows it to react in a certain way. In the case of human beings, human beings are obviously much more complicated than cylinders, uh, but in the case of human beings, a similar thing holds. What we have is that we have external causes that push us to act or not to act in certain ways, but we also have internal causes. And part of the internal causes, the internal causes are made out of our physiology. You know, like I get thirsty. Why do I get thirsty? Because my physiology is such that at some point, if I didn't drink enough, I will get thirsty. So there are internal causes that are physiological in nature. And then there are internal causes that are the result of reasoning. We have an ability to reason. And so we think about stuff. And so for instance, right now I'm, I'm thirsty and I would like to go out you know, in the kitchen and grab a beer. I'm not gonna do that, even though I'm thirsty. Why? Because I have this thing with you guys and it wouldn't be polite to just leave you hanging for a few minutes until I go get a beer. Also, if I start drinking beer in the middle of a conversation, that might not be making for the most clear conversation uh, ever. So I'm not gonna do it. What happened there? One of my internal causes, my ability to reason, stopped me from doing certain things and said, you know, yes, it's true that you would like to do this kind of thing. But in fact, right now, given the situation and given my internal abilities to reason about the situation, which are part of the causal structure of the universe, I decide not to go for the beer. The peculiar thing, the, the big difference between us and the cylinder is that our ability to reason is recursive. The cylinder is what the cylinder is. The nature of the cylinder doesn't change. But the nature of our ability to think does change because it can be applied to itself. We can, it's, you know, it's, uh, thinking is a, is a recursive process. You can apply it to itself and therefore you can change the way you think over time. It's still all natural. It's still all the result of cause and effect, but it's important to realize according to Chrysippus that some of these causes are actually internally generated and they interact with external causes. So, uh, it's still a deterministic system because it is cause and effect. It is what we would today call in modern philosophy a compatibilist system about, um, about free will, if you want. But I'm going to stop there because I want to go back to the God, the God stuff. So any question or comment about the God stuff before we, I resume? Okay, there's a couple of hands up. Uh, Mark Kaufman first. Massimo. Yeah. There's Sorry. A, Mark. There's yeah. a question in the chat. Okay, uh, Beth, go ahead and read the one in the chat and then we'll go back to Mark. All right. Um, Fernando P. Torado says, when Marcus states providence or atoms throughout meditation, uh, throughout meditations, isn't he alluding that regardless of the origins of the universe slash nature, we are still endowed with reason and we were created to live a virtuous life, in parentheses, pantheist view. Right, so yeah, that's a good question. And I'm glad you brought it up uh, because I was gonna get there next. And so we're gonna get there now before I take the other two questions. Don't lower your hands, uh, just stay there and I'll, I'll call you in a minute. So yes, Marcus Reedus actually has several places. I counted about a dozen places in meditations where he starts a, something that is often referred to as the, it's either gods or atoms uh, argument. You also find that argument by the way in Seneca. It's not as frequent. Uh, but it's found in Seneca, and it's also found in Cicero. So, which means that, you know, it's, this is not just Marcus Aurelius doing this, this stuff. Um, now, the argument goes something like this. Let me read one of these quotes um, in, in full, uh, and then we're going to talk about how that works. So this is from book 12 of the Meditations. Either there is a fatal necessity, an invincible order, or a kind of providence, or a confusion without a purpose and without a director. If then there is an invincible necessity, why do you resist? But if there is a providence that allows itself to be propitiated, make yourself worthy of the help of the divinity. But if there is a confusion without a governor, be content that in such a tempest, you have yourself a certain ruling intelligence. Okay, so what he's saying here um, in context, he's talking about Epicurean physics, right? The big rivals of the Stoics were the Epicureans. And the Epicureans thought that the new universe works by, you know, a bunch of and random movements of atoms bumping into each other. Okay. And that's what he talks when, when he says, when, when uh, Marcus says, um, 
um, uh, let's see, a confusion without a purpose and without a director. That's what he means. That's, that's his representation of the Epicurean physics. He says, so well, it's either that, or there is a fatal necessity, an invincible order. In other words, the universe is deterministic, right? Cause and effect, straight cause and effect. Or third possibility, there is a kind providence. Uh, kind providence, so that would be the living organism kind of, of, of model. And what it's interesting is how he reacts to this situation. Now, I'm not going to suggest, before anybody raises the, this issue, I'm not going to suggest that, that Marcus Aurelius was actually agnostic about this. We have very good reasons to believe, internal to the meditations, that he, he bought the Stoic view. He believed in Stoic providence. He believed in the Stoic God. And the reason for that is because there are several other places in the meditation where he clearly says so. Right. Um, however, he entertained the possibility. And what's important here in terms of our discussion is how he deals with these possibilities. And I'm going to read the, that bit again. He says, well, if then there is an invincible necessity, why do you resist? He says, you know, if things happen just as a cause and effect, well, then you're part of the, the general uh, web of cause and effect. So what the hell? Why are you worried about it? What's, what's your problem? If there is a providence, that would be the stoic model. The, stoic, the preferred stoic model, then allows itself, that allows itself to be propitiated and make yourself worthy of that providence. So this is the foot in the, in the mud kind of model, right? If, if there's a providence, there's a reason why these things are happening, then you need to work within that reason, in accordance with that reason. And what if there is the last possibility? What if there is a confusion without a governor? Well, in that case, be content that in such a tempest, you have yourself a certain ruling intelligence. So it says, even there, you can still decide to act virtuously. You can still use your brain, your, your ruling faculty, to have a decent human life. To me, that makes very strongly the case that is being then uh, sort of um, uh, updated by modern Stoic scholars, such as uh, uh, Lawrence Baker in A New Stoicism, that in fact there is no incompatibility between rejecting the Stoic God, the providential Stoic God, and still retaining Stoic ethics. And the reason for that is because you find it in both Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. They themselves tell you that, you know, if it turns out that the Epicureans are right, that's still fine. You still want to be a virtuous person. You still want to do uh, the right thing. And you still are, uh, you know, are going to act in the same way. So now let me go back to a question. we got a few more minutes, so I'll be able to take two or three. Um, okay, Mark Kaufman first. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, hi. I just... Uh, oh, you're on the bridge of the enterprise, aren't you? Yes, of course. Excellent. Uh, I'm in yeah. Delphi, so it's like, you know. Right. right. <laughs> these, are all, these are all appropriate locations that we're in. Absolutely. Uh, so I just want to, I want to clarify, uh, is there a difference between uh, the Stoic uh, God and uh, the Stoic teleology, or are these uh, all kind of interchangeable terms? Um, they're connected. They're definitely connected because, so teleology is this general term, which uh, it's used a lot actually by Aristotle, uh, that there are, there are final causes. There is there's some kind of you know, final cause for everything that happens, right? There is a purpose in a sense. There's a, there's, a, there's a reason why things happen. Now, Aristotle didn't mean actually in the, nothing like the Christian sense. He did talk about an ultimate you know, prime mover, basically, an ultimate you know, an initiator of everything in the universe. But he certainly wasn't thinking of anything like the Christian, the Christian God. But nevertheless, he thought that uh, there's a teleological aspect to nature. Uh, if you see a seedling, one of his examples is if you see a seedling, you know it's gonna become, given you know, favorable circumstances, it's gonna become a tree. So the purpose of the seedling is to become a tree. The function of the seedling is to become a tree. That's teleology, right? Okay. Now, um, in modern terms, People actually make a distinction, philosophers make a distinction between teleonomy and teleology, uh, where teleology is this sort of purpose, it has this purposive connotation to it. Teleonomy is a related concept which does away, however, with the purpose part. So the theory of natural selection, for instance, is teleonomic, but not teleologic. Um, what Darwin suggested was that, yes, it is true that the seedling is going to become a tree, and that the purpose of the seedling is to become a tree, but there is no intelligence behind this. There is no creative force behind this. It's just a natural process, right? So a teleonomic process is something that appears to be teleological, 
but it's not ultimately. Um, so next I have, uh, well, real, real quick, real, real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So then, so then the Stoics would, uh, their view, uh, about yeah. God is teleonomical, not teleological. Well, that is a good question. That is actually part of what the, this discussion among modern Stoics is about. Is it teleonomic or is it teleological? Because, um, so my position is that if you interpret the Stoic, the ancient Stoics and Epictetus does sound teleological. Uh, okay, in, in, in many places of the discourses. Because when he talks about the foot and the, and the mud, he sounds teleological. When he says that you shouldn't just accept things, but be glad of those things, he sounds, to me at least, more teleological. And that's the part that I reject. I think that, that we don't need that. Yeah. But the alternative is to make the same exact move that, Mark, that Darwin made, right? And say, well, okay, but I'm still gonna retain most of what Epictetus is saying. The only part that I'm gonna drop is the, and be glad. So if I get sick, I say, you know, we are, you know, Zeus forbid, but we are in the middle of a pandemic, so I could get COVID-19, right? And if that should happen, I'm going to go and read to myself the same passage by Epictetus, but I'm just going to modify it slightly. I am going to say, well, you need to accept this because, first of all, you don't have any choice. This is, this is the way the world works. And second of all, you knew that you were a human being, and therefore you can, you're subject to sickness and to viruses and things like that. What are you going to do about it? Uh, let's see what you can do about it. You know, take medications, take care of yourself, but there's only so much you can do about it because you're a human being. So I'm fine. I'm okay. Mentally prepared. We'll see if that happens, but I'm mentally prepared. I think I'm mentally prepared to say, hey, yes, I accept this because this is the way the world, the world actually works. What I'm not going to say is the additional thing and be glad. I'm not going to behave. I'm not going to think like the food in the mud because there is no, no mud to cross. There is no there's no organism that has to cross the path, uh, or at least I don't believe there is. And therefore, that sort of consolation is not open to me. And I do understand that that's a loss. Right? If yeah. you believe, if you accept the Stoic God and you're a pantheist, you have an advantage over me. Because you're going to actually be literally happy. The famous phrase, amor fati, love your faith, which is not a Stoic faith, uh, phrase, it's, it's Nietzsche, but nevertheless, that notion is that if you believe in the pantheistic providential story God, then you have the, this option available and good for you. I just can't go there. I can't, I can't, uh, but I'm close. I think I'm close enough. I don't think that that actually undermines the entire ethical system. It just, uh, it makes it more modest. It's instead of saying, well, these things happen in, in the nature of things to happen. And I'm glad I say it's in the nature of, the, of things to happen and I have to accept it. Um, okay, next we get uh, Umberto um, Rosato. Umberto, are you there? Uh, yes, Massimo, I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so actually, no, what you said before kind of answered my question, but I wanted to you know, ask that to you again, because you sure. say even if we actually reject the Stoic God, this yeah. actually doesn't mean that we cannot keep Stoic habits. Right. And I think this kind of relies to what ultimately we substitute the Stoic God with, right? Because we can substitute with something and ending up with a, having exactly the same result as we, as we were keeping the Stoic God. And, yeah. you know, one, one actually example that I like to cite is, uh, you know, I'm also a scientist, you know, and so the Maya stuff, you know, they actually yeah. I think, believe that actually the world was flat and yet they were excellent astrologers. They were excellent. They were able to pinpoint the position of a planet years from now even though yeah. their model of how the universe works was yeah. completely wrong, according to our son. But this, even if the model was wrong, by calculation, twisting up and up, they were able actually to arrive at exactly the same prediction and in the stock model, the same action as that, that we have a different model. So I think the question yeah. in the stock God, but what you substituted with, it gets even more important at this point in time. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I think that you are actually definitely onto something. Uh, I would say more broadly, uh, actually, I see in, in, the, in this chat, there is my, my friend Chris, and we often have these discussions, and Chris and I tend to agree that you can even think of science in general as in the business, not of searching for truth, but for searching, in searching for, for models that are empirically adequate, right? So that you don't have to be espousing any particular model that, let's say, you don't have to say quantum mechanics is true or general relativity is true, or Newtonian mechanics is true. I don't know what that means or how we would possibly find out that that is the case. But what you can say is, 
uh, you know, Newtonian mechanics gets a lot of things right, so it's an adequate model for certain things. And general relativity gets even more things right, so it's an even better model uh, for navigating the universe and understanding how to navigate the universe is put together. So it's all about models. And so you can replace, similarly, in terms of metaphysics, you can replace one model with another. Now, in my case, I just, I kind of become allergic to the word God, so I don't want to use that, that word. Yeah, because it I has follow some of your debates, yeah. I know. Yeah, so it's con the problem is it's got very heavy cultural connotations. Yeah. Look, if, if somebody were to tell me, hey, what I mean by God is the universal web of cause and effect, fine, <laughs> not a problem there. I don't have an objection to that. That. But then I would want to, to know why would you call that God, given that most people that are going to listen to you talking are going to actually immediately go in the directions that you're clearly not intending. So what right? they think is their God, yeah. Yeah. So and my substitute is simply, essentially, Einstein's substitute is nature. Yeah, I, I just say, you know, I believe in nature. I definitely believe in nature. There's no question about it. And nature has certain regularities, and those regularities have certain consequences. So, uh, guys, we got a few more minutes. Uh, we can get to Daniel Libin. Daniel, are you there? Hi, hi, hi. I just want to add that um, Einstein said uh, God doesn't play dice with the universe, so we use that yeah. sense God is also being for nature as well. Sure, that's right. That's um, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, now, I want to say yes. Uh, Einstein famously did say that apparently more than once, enough that he actually annoyed the hell out of Bohr, who uh, at one point he allegedly responded commented that he wished that Einstein would stop telling God what to do and what not to do, <laughs> you know, playing dice and all that. But it's obvious that that was a sort of a metaphorical understanding of right, the word God. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. The other question I had was um, uh, Marcus Aurelius with his disjunctive statements. Yes. He seems like he's stepping outside of, Stoic, of Stoicism, of Stoic thinking, to provide a rationale for another way of thinking about it. And that seems like it's a self-defeating way of, of getting it out. Like he can't, he can't provide a rationale within Stoic thinking other than thinking of this pantheistic God. So he's going to, he's supplying like some external reason or external thinking to Stoicism. Is that, first of all, is that true? Secondly, is that then a legitimizing way of recognizing a way out of the pantheism? Because Marcus Aurelius is thereby almost redefining or re, or providing an alternate explanation for thinking about the universe. Um, so what do you think he's trying to step out of exactly? Well, because he's giving these, he's giving these, he's giving, he's giving these either or statements. You can right. think this way or you can right. think that way. Right. So that second way is inconsistent with traditional Stoic idea, idea, ideas and notions. So yes. he's, so, so, okay, yes. so providing that, he's giving you something that's external to Stoic thinking and yeah. is that like an update of Stoic thinking because it's Marcus Aurelius and he's like this, you know, this is this incredibly important Stoic? Yeah. Or is he just, no. just using, so, or is he just using something external to Stoicism to, right. to explain it? Now, now, I, now I understand it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to answer this and then guys, we're going to have to wrap it up because we're past the hour. So yeah, great question. Um, no, he's not the first one to do that. There is actually a tradition in Stoicism going all the most to the beginning. Arist Aristo was one of the early Stoics. He was a contemporary of Zeno. Um, and he actually was, uh, he suggested that Stoicism, Stoics should drop physics and logic entirely. That doesn't matter, that we should just do, it, do, do ethics. And of course, people pointed out to him, I don't know how gently, that if you do that, then Stoicism becomes cynicism. And so you might as well go and join Diogenes uh, a synopy. Um, but the point being uh, that plenty of Stoics before have had actually doubts about specific aspects of Stoic physics and even Stoic ethics, in fact. Posidonius and Panicius, both of them were from the middle store and they both had disagreements with certain aspects of Stoic physics and Stoic um, uh, um, you know, um, ethics. So the point is Marcus is just the last of a long line of Stoics that kind of at least contemplate possibly that there are um, there are problems there, but that shouldn't be surprising, right? So philosophies are a, a dynamic thing. They don't stay just like religions. And as much as a lot of religious people would say, no, no, I, this is the little word of God. It's never the little word of God. Uh, it's, it's always reinterpreted and through, through time. And people always change their mind. The Christ, modern Christianity is nothing like the Christianity of 2000 years ago. And so 
Stoicism in ancient times lasted for more than 500 years. And, you know, they had disagreements, both among themselves and as well as uh, with, with other, uh, other people uh, outside. And that's, you know, their disagreements with, uh, uh, I'm looking for a quote here, the disagreements with um, the skeptics, with the Epicureans, etc. right? So each one of these, uh, these schools learned from each other. And there is no, nothing problematic about it. I think, it, you know, these systems are sufficiently flexible. They're not infinitely flexible. I do think that there are certain things that if you do away with, you're not talking stoicism anymore. One of them is the dichotomy of control. If you don't actually, the dichotomy of control is not pr uh, present just in Epictetus, it's, it's everywhere. And it is a fundamental notion in stoicism. If you do away with that, then, then I'm going to start questioning whether, why you want to call that whatever is left stoicism. But this notion that, the notion is that Stoic metaphysics and even Stoic logic are not rigidly connected with Stoic ethics. In other words, if they were, if the three were just a, you know, like a rigid thing, that if you move one, you automatically have to move the other ones, then we would have a problem. But I don't think they are. They're never, not only in Stoicism, but in any philosophy or religion, the metaphysics is not, it is not that tightly connected with the ethics. They are connected. I mean, think, think about Buddhism, for instance, right? The Buddhist ethics can be practiced by secular Buddhists as well as by religious Buddhists. And if it were true that Buddhist metaphysics had to be accepted rigidly as it was present, is presented in one of the, the, the Buddhist schools, then all the other Buddhist schools would be out of, out of business. That's clearly not the case. So it's a good question to ask, well, how much leeway do I have? Where do I, where, where is there a breaking point? Because there, there are breaking points. I just happen to think that this is not one of the breaking points. Uh, and so I don't think that Marcus is trying to get out of the Stoic system. He's just saying, he's just contemplating the possibility that the Stoics were in fact incorrect, that the, the standard Stoic physics was incorrect in that particular respect. And then he was asking himself, well, so what, did that, what, it, what follows from that in terms of the ethics, which after all is what we all care about. The Stoics were very clear that the reason to study physics and logic is so that you get a good ethics, right? So let me close this with this quote, which is one of my favorite quotes. It's, this is from, from Seneca, from the letters to Lucilius, from the 23rd letter to Lucilius. And it makes it clear that the Stoic themselves, and Seneca in particular, understood that these things are all open to debate and that we should debate them. That we shouldn't be any, uh, you know, oh, Zeno said so, therefore, that's the only thing it goes. He says here, will I not walk in the footsteps of my predecessors? I will indeed use the ancient road, but if I find another route that is more direct and has fewer ups and downs, I will stake out that one. Those who advance these doctrines before us are not our masters, but our guides. The truth lies open to all. It has not yet been taken over. Much is left also for those yet to come. So he's saying, you know, yes, Zeno said this, Chrysippus said that, now let's look at the reasons. And if the reasons hold up, great. If they don't, then, you know, the fact that it was Chrysippus doesn't matter. It's, you know, this is not scripture. One of the advantages of a philosophy of a religion is that you're not going to be thrown out of the club because, you know, you don't believe in the word of, the, of scripture. The Epictetus is not scripture. It was, a, these were smart people who had, who invented a really interesting, logically, internally consistent system that has a lot of application to real life still today, 2,300 years, 2,400 years later. That is a testament to their ability to think through the human condition. But we're not wet into any particular thing uh, that, they, that they're saying. So I am going to close uh, on, on this one. Uh, again, you know, thank you so much for coming and uh, stay safe. I'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.